we've already covered the basics of prediction. We know that there are three steps. Step one, feature extraction. And we understand that we have to extract features that allow us a flexible approximation of the condition expectation. And then step two, training the model. And this amounts to an OLS regression on our training sample. And then step three is profit. This is where we use um, our estimated coefficients to make predictions um, on a data set where we don't observe the variable that um, we want to predict. In this video, we are going to discuss prediction error and in particular, you know, the expected prediction error. We have an out of sample observation W1 for which we want to predict the corresponding Y using the information contained in W out of sample. The best prediction we can make is the conditional expectation. We're going to replace the conditional expectation by something a little bit uh, less complex, a best linear prediction in certain features. We don't know what these coefficients are, and we have to estimate them. And to do that, we're going to need a training sample. And from this training sample, we can obtain the OLS estimators. these OLS estimators will estimate the coefficients of the best linear prediction. And to put together our final prediction, we combine combining these um, OLS estimates with um, the features that we observe out of sample. Now, this expression estimates this. So in the end, we end up doing is we try, we're predicting this observed variable by this expression. And so this, um, there's several steps here. And in each of those steps, we can make uh, mistakes. The first reason why we probably will not be able to predict um, the outcome exactly is this step. We're using the best linear prediction and there will be a part in Y out of sample that is completely unpredictable from this information. And this is, you know, so even if we were able to predict this exactly, we would deviate from the outcome because there's some part that is just inherently unpredictable. And this kind of uh, mistake is called the idiosyncratic error. Then we are not actually using this and rather we are approximating it by this. And so there's a approximation error. And sometimes the approximation error is also called the bias. Finally, we have to estimate this guy and um, you know, we will not be able to figure out these coefficients exactly, so there will be estimation error when we replace them by the uh, OLS coefficients. So that is some um, additional source of error, and this is called 
the estimation error. So whenever you um, are dealing with prediction, you have to deal with these three sources of error. Next, we are going to relate these three sources of error to the expected prediction error. That is, and we're going to rewrite this expression into three parts. And each part will correspond to a source of error. To do that, we are going to assume something about the generative process. So we're going to assume that we can write y is the condition expectation given w plus some error term u. And that by itself is not restrictive. You can always write y like that. But now here's our assumption. We're assuming that these two parts, these two components, are statistically independent. So we're going to need this assumption only for our decomposition. In general, for our predictive methods to work, we don't uh, require any assumptions about our generative process. So this assumption is only needed to get a nice um, decomposition of the prediction error that will give us a very nice intuition that applies even if, if this assumption doesn't um, hold. We will now decompose the average prediction error into three parts. And the first part will be as follows. This part of the prediction error gives us the effect of u on the quality of our prediction. And since u is independent of w1, we can um, never predict it. So this is our idiosyncratic error. The second component of the EPE is as follows. This part of the prediction error is non-zero if the condition expectation is different from the best linear prediction that we're using it to approximate it. So this part represents the approximation error. And then there's a final third part of the EPE. This part exists because our coefficients for the best linear prediction are different typically from what well as estimates. So this represents um, this step here. Estimation error. And this is also sometimes called the variance component of the EPE. Before I discuss this decomposition in more detail, I want to emphasize that it is a that it is a decomposition that holds with equality. So that means that what I have here on the right hand side is just a more um, complicated way of writing writing this, even though I haven't gone through the exact algebra that is needed to, to prove that. But you find some uh, more details in the lecture notes. Let's talk a little bit about these expectations. So what kind of uncertainty are they averaging over? So let's start with the idiosyncratic error. It depends only on the uncertainty about um, who I'm predicting for. So uncertainty about the out of sample draw. 
So the expectation is only over the out of sample observation. The same is true for the um, bias component. But the estimation error depends on both uncertainty about who I'm predicting for and uncertainty from the training sample. The idiosyncratic error component does not depend on our choice of features. So the features don't show up here. So choosing a different set of features will not help bring it down. Also, it depends only on uncertainty about the out-of-sample draw. It doesn't depend on the training sample. So choosing a larger training sample will not help bring it down. So nothing we can actually do will um, change the idiosyncratic error. So we may um, as well ignore it when we think about how to choose and estimate a predictive model. So let's ignore this one. Next, the bias component tells us how well we can approximate the unconditional expectation by combining features in a linear way. So it will be easier to get a good approximation if we have lots and lots of features, so lots of nonlinear transformations that allow us to replicate you know, a very um, complex nonlinear form of the conditional expectation. So for the purposes of the bias component, more axes are a good idea. Finally, the variance component exists because our estimated coefficients don't exactly match the coefficients we're trying to estimate. This is called estimation error. So estimation error will be more severe the more coefficients we have to estimate. So for the purposes of having a small variance component, we prefer to not have too many features. More axes are often bad. So obviously it's impossible to choose a large number of axes and simultaneously choose a small number of axes. To get a low EPE, you want to choose a number of axes that is not too small and not too large. So that is large enough to give you a reasonably small bias component and that is small enough so that your variance component doesn't explode. This is called the bias variance trade-off of prediction.